consider uh, finding me where I write at Natural Selections. This last week, I wrote a bit about dominance hierarchies and gender norms in humans. The week before, I wrote about beavers and their foundational role in uh, in basically architecting the landscapes of North America and the ecosystems of, of North America. And yesterday, uh, we dropped an episode uh, on the same topic uh, in which you were talking to the wonderful Jacob Shockey, who hey. is a former student of ours and a friend of ours. And uh, you had an almost three-hour conversation. Almost three-hour conversation. And then, as you know, um, Jacob stuck around and we did some fun stuff, but it turned out there was just a whole lot of stuff that uh, he had to say about beavers that uh, is going to have to wait for a, a volume two because, you know. Absolutely. There's some, there's some very interesting stuff that didn't make it into the podcast. Yeah. And uh, I haven't listened to the entire podcast yet. I did read the piece that I wrote on account of having written it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, a couple of the, the points that have stuck with me specifically are um, the mitigating effect on loss of biodiversity and on um, extreme weather and climate conditions like drought and flood uh, and fire, uh, especially in the American West. And then also the fact that, and I know that you talked about this in your conversation with Jacob as well in the Dark Horse podcast that dropped yesterday, um, but that the, the beaver trappers were so successful at what they did. And still to this day, the beavers that remain are very docile. So it's interesting that they, that the beaver trap, the in intensive beaver trapping over hundreds of years did not have the selective effect on the behavior, on the personality of beavers that you might expect, that they remain sort of easy to approach in many regards. Um, but they were effectively eradicated through so much of the American West that when the eminent naturalist Grinnell, uh, came through in the, I think it was the 1930s, his natural history notes from his tour of the American West basically framed, you know, put into place an expectation among ecologists of what, of what we were trying to recover to, which of course is always a dicey proposition, you know, aiming, aiming for a single moment in a shifting over both space and time landscape. Uh, but he saw, Grinnell saw so so little beavers that even so few beavers, yeah, depending bit. on if it's a collective down or not, um, and you know, like us, did not infer from the landscape that what he was seeing was extraordinary evidence of an abundance of beavers throughout you know many many tens of thousands at least of years. The ghost of beavers past. Yes, that he he said you know he he basically made a number of claims based on what he saw. But he then made inference that was wrong. And from that, we have historical range maps that are inaccurate because they're based on this great naturalist who was normally so good at what he did. But even, even he did not see through basically the, the fog of time. So I wanted to add one thing to that. So uh, probably because beavers were trapped primarily, um, the... Rem the remnant of their uh, approachability might uh, not be a strong indicator of how selected they were by that interaction. And in fact, um, well, actually, this runs a little bit counter to what I just said, but what I learned from Jacob after the podcast was that although it has been generally our experience, your and mine, and generally accepted by most people who uh, talk about beavers in a scientific context, that they are nocturnal, that mm -hmm. there's actually good reason to think that that is a switch, mm -hmm. that they have moved into a nocturnal niche, presumably to avoid people, mm -hmm. um, and that the evidence for this, which because is- Because trappers are lazy. <laughs> or because not all beavers well, go nocturnal at once, and so it, you know you, you you evade the trappers. Yeah, but also just because we're diurnal, and so we're not as good at hunting at night. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, you hobble. Yeah, la lazy for good reason. <laughs> yeah, right. right. Lazy as a matter of self-preservation in, in large measure. But um, but the lack of the tapetum lucidum in the eye, that is the reflective surface that causes nocturnal animals' eyes to shine. If you ever shine a flashlight at a dog at night, you see the eyes shine back. That absence suggests that this was not in initially um, a nocturnal creature. And it's interesting, I know another story where a creature has um, moved into diurnality mm -hmm. by the same mechanism, which is a very strange well, thing. Well, for the same reason. For the same reason. And this is um, the one and only example of a bat 
that is diurnal, that bat appears to have been nocturnal in origin, but it is hunted by people in the roost, and so it pays to be out when people are up doing their hunting. So just this is a, a macro or mega, whatever it mega, was. Mega, mega, mega chiroptera. Yeah. So this is one of the fl like flying foxes. This is one of these big beefy bats that actually would provide, you know, sustenance for a family of humans as opposed to these little micro bats yeah. that we've got here in the new world more of a snack bat yeah this is a, this is a full meal snack bat uh, <laughs> all right i take it back but in any case interesting that uh beavers do appear to have been modified in this way and it hasn't seemed it hasn't changed their approachability so much but it has changed the likelihood of an encounter mm -hmm. based on yeah. them being primarily nocturnal although i will say um at least two of the instances in which uh, I've seen beavers, it was during the day. Right. Um, one in Oaks Bottom down in Portland, and one you and I saw a beaver. I want to say Eastern Washington somewhere. Yeah, it was. East it, of the was Cascades. it was in it was in the Cascades. Mm -hmm. uh, very interesting animal that we get we got to watch quite a bit. I was also reminded of a um <laughs> it's funny. Uh, I found Jacob, during the podcast, talked a little bit about the fact that his first encounter with a beaver had been at the bus stop at the Loop at Evergreen, that one had trundled, trundled by, and we had both remarked... He'd never seen a beaver before that? I don't think so. Even though he... Uh, interesting. Even, given and, where he grew up, that's interesting. Yeah. And uh, anyway, his point was he should have followed it, because what the hell was it doing there? There's no obvious reason for a beaver to be there. And then as I was falling asleep last night, I realized that there was a... There was a, an episode in my teaching at Evergreen where I didn't see a beaver, but I was biking along the bike path on the main road there, mm -hmm. um, and I saw a beaver sign, mm -hmm. right? I saw a place where beavers had chewed some sticks, and it's in a little culvert, right? A, no place that a beaver could possibly hope to create any kind of useful uh, pond, yeah. and I had, I had brought my students and my co-faculty there and they disbelieved me that it was real. And so anyway, Jacob's observation of a beaver, you know, what would be a block and a half from where I found beaver sign is um, interesting. They're, for whatever reason, they're active up on the road there. Yeah. No, and I actually think and no one else will know the particular uh, geography of the area around Evergreen. But yeah, I, I actually am remembering areas that now, now that I think on it feel feel beaverful to me. Yeah, and in fact, there is one uh, across that road. Mm -hmm. um, there, is right. a, there is a wetland that is otherwise inexplicable. Yeah. So I'm exactly. thinking that's it. Uh, so, so check both of those things out. Check out uh, the podcast, uh, the Dark Horse podcast from yesterday and uh, my natural selections piece from two weeks ago. And uh, we'll continue. Hopefully, we'll have Jacob back and, um, and we'll continue talking about this. Mm -hmm.